We'll begin with the roll call and Vicki will start. Mayor Sue Patterson. Present. Deputy Mayor Warren Dickert. Present. Councillor Harold Fleet. Present. Councillor Dave Hawking. Present. Councillor Carol Hudson. Present. Councillor Brandon Cable. Present. Councillor Susan Sackle. Thanks, Vicki. All members are present and accounted for. Our land acknowledgement. As we work toward reconciliation with Indigenous people, we begin our meeting today by respectfully acknowledging that we are situated on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek Nation, the people of three fires known as Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi Nations and further give thanks to the Chippewas of Saugeen and the Chippewas of Nawash, now known as the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, as the traditional keepers of this land. So welcome to our regular council meeting for Monday, September 18th, 2023. Good afternoon, council, staff, guests, the viewing public and the media. Council, does anyone have a disclosure of pecu pecuniary interest or a conflict of interest? Seeing none, if one should arise during the meeting, you may declare it then. Item five on our agenda is additions or deletions, and we do not have any, and we do not have any delegations. So, and seven, we do not have any business arising from the minutes. So we'll start with item eight, which is council and committee of the whole minutes. 8.1 is our regular council meeting minutes from August 14th. And I need a mover and seconder to put those on the floor. Councillor Sackle and Councillor Cable. That uh, meeting, we had a public meeting uh, for an official plan, official plan amendment, OPA 5, and a zoning bylaw amendment, Z323. This was with regards to a proposed automobile service, service and sales use for Volkswagen at 118th Avenue, and both those amendments were approved with our bylaws. We also had uh, three delegations that evening. We had Kelly uh, Linton and Andy Gold Goldie with Linton Consulting Services giving us an overview of our strategic plan. We had Enterprise Fleet Management regarding a vehicle lease program. And we also uh, recognized Constable Reagan Bill and Constable Devin Perdue for their exceptional bravery and courage uh, when they entered a burning building uh, to evacuate the occupants. So those are just some highlights. If there's any questions or comments about those minutes, I'll take them. If not, I'll uh, ask the question all in favor. That is carried, thank you. Item uh, 8.2 is committee of the whole meeting minutes from September 5th. I need a mover and seconder for those, Councillor Hudson and Deputy Mayor Dickert. So those uh, committee of the whole minutes, we had a delegation from uh, Food Cycle Science with regards to their uh, waste diversion system with a countertop food cycler. And we also approved the 2024 budget process timelines along with reports and correspondence. Any comments or questions? I'll call the question, all those in favor? That is carried, thank you. Item nine is staff reports, and we have one, 9.1, we have a report PB23-23. The subject is the net zero fire hall construction, and it's from Andrew Wilkin, our director of building and planning, also our CBO, and from our fire chief, Chief Deniger. And I need a mover and seconder for that. Councillor Hawking and Councillor Fleet. All yours, Andrew. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, in accordance with the approved fire hall charter, uh, the project team provided updates to council uh, at six different times to date. Uh, this is the seventh, uh, the most exciting one. Um, at the most recent update on June the 5th, council directed staff to proceed with the release of tender documents for the construction of a new net zero fire hall. At the time of the discussions, the projected total budget, construction budget, was $7,495,000. If you remember 
495,000 of that amount was for items uh, excluded from the base contract, uh, security systems, sound, AV equipment, uh, fire department equipment, and furnishings. On August the 8th, 2023, the tender was released publicly. It was advertised on the town website and bid and go. Uh, the tender deadline uh, originally uh, towards the end of August was asked for an extension by uh, general contractors and was extended to September the 13th. Six general contractors were present at the mandatory site visit on August the 23rd, 2023. Five of them ultimately closed the proposals on the 13th. Uh, we decided to have a mandatory site meeting um, for general contractors because it, it helps ensure or tell us how many interested parties there are actually going to be when the bids were going to occur. Uh, the summary is as follows. Uh, in your chart included in your report, there is a summary of all the tenders received, as well as their anticipated start date and the duration of work. Um, all the tenders submitted were deemed to be complete as per the requirements within the tender documents, uh, which were reviewed by Dolly Engineering at time of opening. Uh, based on the communication with Dolly Engineering following the tender close, uh, their staff communicated to town staff Based on the tenders received, we would recommend awarding the project to the lowest bidder, Dom Construction LTD, for the tendered price of $5,990,000. Recommendation of award of tender is based on tender price, options, con subcontractor list, timing, and price breakdown provided by Dom Construction. Dom Construction has quite a history of completing uh, fire halls in particular, volunteer fire halls as well. Uh, and have a very positive history of completing other local projects. Uh, the, financial, the financial implications, as detailed in prior reports, uh, the construction costs are only a portion of the complete project costs. Based on Dom Construction's proposal, the overall project cost projected is to be as follows. Uh, it's provided a bit of a breakdown here. Um, $500,000 contingency in the contract uh, to allow for unforeseen items as they come up. What wasn't included is the electrical service, which we're working with West Stereo on currently. Uh, that $300,000 is an estimated figure from Dolly Engineering and Calidus Engineering, the M&E consultant, uh, which is carried in here, as well as the furnishings uh, contingency that was mentioned on the June 5th report to Council. So therefore, the projected construction costs is $7,285,000. I did show the contract administration fee that was originally um, taken on as Dolly Engineering completed the design and administration that wasn't included in the original port June 5th. Just thought it was prudent to put that in now as it can provide council a full picture of the cost of the project, including the administrative costs, which comes to $7,535,000 for a net zero fire hall. Um, capital budget costs of 1,400,000 were approved for the year 2023. The remaining costs of the new fire hall are within 2024 capital projects. Our staff team of finance, fire, and building are currently working on applying for numerous funding opportunities uh, at this time, which we are very excited about. And Jeff can speak to those more if you have any questions. Uh, in addition, uh, fire staff are implementing the firefighter training environmental campaign as approved in the June 2023 and includes a number of sponsorship opportunities specific to the training elements included in this new fire hall. The link to the strategic plan is uh, safe and reliable infrastructure, healthy and welcoming community, balanced growth and open and responsible government. And the recommendation is that report PB 23-23 net zero fire hall construction be received, that the project be awarded to Dom Construction LTD for a total cost of 5,990,000 plus HST, and that the mayor and CAO be authorized to enter into a contract with Dom Construction Limited for the construction of the new net zero fire hall. And I will answer any questions you have. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, Councillor Sackle. Thank you, Your Worship. 
And thank you, Andrew, for the report. I too am excited about this project as it's moving forward. And I'm happy to read that Dom Construction has done other fire halls. So I think that's wonderful experience. But I'm wondering how Dom can do the project in 36 weeks when some of the others are 56 and 64 weeks. Does Dom have a bigger crew or just, I'd like some feedback on that. Thank you. Through your worship, that's a great question. Um, I would say Dom Construction has the most fire hall experience. Um, they've also built fire halls as designed by the same consultant, uh, Dolly Engineering. So I would say they have a historical perspective of how long it would take for them to build. So if they're saying it's 36 weeks, um, it would be achievable to them at 36 weeks. I would say in my past career, I would have normally probably said 56 too. It's nice to say 56 and come in at 45. Um, obviously weather could play a part of this as well. We are starting it in the fall, potentially, um, those 36 weeks likely maybe have some provisions in there for weather, but depending on how the winter is, uh, how wet the spring is, that could cost some time in there as well. Um, but to your other point, uh, Dom construction does have a large in-house crew. I mean, I think they have over a hundred employees themselves. Uh, so yeah, so could be a bit of both. Okay, hey, Councillor Cable. Uh, thank you, Worship, and thank you for the update, Andrew. It's another exciting step forward for this project. Um, and it's great to see that we had many local contractors that bid on it. Um, I think Don is certainly well known in the region for their quality construction work, and it's really exciting that they're able to start this project in October. Um, just wondering, have there been any issues identified to date with the net zero elements of the project, or um, does Don feel fairly confident in, in that aspect of the project as well? Uh, through your Worship, I... Town staff haven't been directly in contact with Dom Construction on this. Um, I would say that town staff and uh, Dolly Engineering are very confident with how the documents were put together that it's clear. Um, they bid those documents as part of the contract, so um, they haven't brought up any issues or concerns at this point. Um, there are none that we we know of right now. Uh, hopefully, there is nothing major, and you know part of perhaps what a little bit of the contingency may have to go towards if there were some some gray areas or some some things we find along the way that maybe we'd like to add. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Fleet. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for your report. Uh, this is great news. Uh, within budget, using a well-respected local contractor, also using a number of area subcontractors, which I think is huge for our economy. And I think it's a bonus for our local economy. So I think it's well done. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Deputy Mayor Dickert. Thank you, Your Worship. I was just curious as to the $300,000 for the West Terrio portion. Seems high, are, are like, are, is there no hydro service in the proximity of that building site or uh, what is driving that cost so high? Or is it the net zero and all the metering that has to be done to accommodate that? Through your worship, yeah, a lot of it is the net zero, and I think um, some of it being the unknown uh, at this time with conversations is, I guess, not as early as they are with West Aerial, but uh, Calidus, the mechanical electrical consultant, I think, maybe erred on the side of caution a little bit on that three hundred thousand dollar figure, but um, yeah, we're hope we're hopeful it's it's less than that, but that was the figure I was provided through the consultant, so that's what I thought I should stick with on this one. Other comments or questions? Councillor Cable? Well, thank you, Worship. Since um, Andrew kind of brought up the idea, I'm wondering if um, Chief Deniger wanted to comment on any, any of the grants or, or potential funding sources um, that we're investigating. Through your Worship. Uh, so uh, um, Chris has helped with some of the applications. There's a federal and provincial, a uh, separate, uh, which if we get them could total up to 1.8 million. And then uh, we haven't started marketing the sponsorship program yet because we wanted to wait, but we've already got 7,500 towards the uh, training sponsorship. Once, uh, you know, if this is approved, then we'll start marketing that to some uh, industry in the area to see if there's potentially more interest. So uh, 1.8 is the, is the big one between the federal and provincial application for Green Municipal Fund and then a uh, one that's that's focused more directly on training. 
and the training area of the of the fire station. Excellent, thank you. All right, I will call the question. All in favor of net zero fire hall construction, report PB twenty three dash twenty three. That is carried. Thank you. Item 10 is committees of council minutes, and we have two sets of minutes. So I need one mover and one seconder to cover both of those. I have Councillor Sackle and Councillor Hudson. So the first one uh, is the Hanover Walkerton Waste Management Committee minutes. Deputy Mayor Dickert, if you would highlight those, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, we did meet on September 12th and had a uh, delegation, Chris Lesperance from Able Pest Control, and his uh, presentation was regarding uh, gull control at the uh, landfill site. He did stress to us, we do not have seagulls here, we have heron gulls, apparently. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, three options that he laid out as far as uh, trying to control that uh, are audio distress, pyrotechnics, and falconry. The audio costs about $10,000 with uh, some, some limited success and needs to be changed on a routine basis. And there may be some other noise concerns that uh, might be, uh, that might come about as a result of that application. Uh, pyrotechnics, such as the bangers and cannons, use noise to displace birds. The cost for that varies, uh, but again, the noise could be problematic for anyone close, living in close proximity to the landfill site. And uh, falconry uses birds of prey to keep gulls away and uh, needs to be done on a somewhat continuous basis. And the cost for that could be up to about $60,000 for, for four months. Um, the gulls are attracted to the landfill site and they're also attracted to the lake. So it's uh, kind of the perfect storm, I guess, for uh, this pest control that uh, that has been brought to our attention. Uh, there have uh, there was a letter received from uh, residents of the uh, lake with their concern with it. And uh, it's actually kind of a, a joint problem as uh, Mr. Uh, Lesperance was saying, because the lake attracts them as well as the uh, the landfill site. So um, more to be uh, found out on that issue, I guess. And uh, we'll, we'll see where we can go with that. The, the good part is with fall coming, they tend to disappear for the winter months and we, we do have some time to work on it. So. Uh, we discussed the uh, drop-off zone that has appeared on the uh, right-hand side of the landfill driveway as you're going in there. So they're going to be installing some uh, no drunking signs and uh, contact made with that property owner to see if we can discourage that from uh, taking place. It does become somewhat unsightly after a while. Uh, the goods exchange trailer will remain closed. Uh, the trailer is in a poor state of repair and currently used for styrofoam storage. It also does tend to attract some after hours scavengers and uh, creates uh, some maintenance issues. Uh, there's also organizations in both Walker and Hanover that will take used items used in their uh, fundraising efforts. Uh, typically, or I shouldn't say typically, but what we have found is uh, many times the materials that get put in there ends up on the landfill site anyway, because they are difficult to get rid of. Nobody else really wants it. And it's just kind of defers the, the trip to the face of the landfill site. Um, we reviewed the tipping fees and the committee is recommending a fee increase to $140 per ton for the uh, sorted materials and unsorted materials will be double that cost at uh, $280 per ton. But the minimum uh, charge to Gwyn will stay the same at the $10. Um, bag tags are not decided by the landfill committee, they're decided by uh, council, so uh, no, no change there. And on the landfill qualities, the curbside Hanover pickup was up 0.43%, Hanover was up, or pardon me, Walkerton was up 1.74% year to date, and the total received at the site was uh, up 3% year to date compared to last year. I would take any questions that there may be. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Are there any questions with regards to those minutes? Councillor Cable. Thank you, Worship. I'm just wondering, Deputy Mayor, in um, item 6.1, the landfill budget, it talks about um, there's a shortfall in revenue and a large increase to the monthly bank interest. Um, so do we have a lot of outstanding debt that's associated with the landfill? Is that where the, the monthly bank interest? I'm assuming that that's a negative, that the, um, the interest that we're paying is going up, or is it it's not that we're getting more money through interest, I'm assuming. It is actually more money. It is a revenue. Uh, 
interest rates have gone up. The reserve funds that we have sitting there are gener generating extra revenue at this point in time. So uh, it, it's actually a good news uh, scenario. Um, so yeah, <laughs> we'll take what we can get. Okay, thank you. All right, so the next, thanks Deputy Mayor, the next set of minutes, uh, 10.2, this is Parks Recreation and Culture Advisory Committee minutes. Uh, Councillor Cable. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, the Parks Recreation and Culture Advisory Committee met on August the 23rd. Um, Park and Water, who is installing the new playground equipment at Robert F. Steers uh, Legion Park on 14th Street, provided an alternative play feature option, um, which would allow multiple children uh, to use the piece at one time. And so the committee felt that that was a, um, a good substitution. And so the Comet um, is going to be added into that play space. And so we look forward to that uh, getting underway in the next couple of months. Uh, several committee members noted uh, the need to finish the park space um, on 14th Street, and we're hopeful that this might be included in the 2024 budget. So we'll have to see what happens there. Um, a trail bridge update was provided. Uh, so preparation for the trail bridge replacements and reconstruction near the south line continues. Uh, procurement of materials is underway, and the engineering plans for the bridges are being reviewed by Saugeen Valley Conservation. So I'm sure that residents um, will be very pleased to see construction begin on that project. And a timeline for the construction should be forthcoming um, and will be provided to the advisory committee and I'm sure will be provided to residents as well. The committee discussed um, the phased implementation of the Center of Excellence Park at Town Park on 7th Ave. Um, with the splash pad being phase one, the committee reviewed plurals recommendations around the phases to ensure that all the necessary items um, to support a splash pad, such as a street crossing on 7th Ave, the parking area, enhanced lighting, and an accessible ramp from the pavilion were included in phase number one. And so I believe that a follow-up staff report will be coming to council to summarize those additional costs. Um, finally, the committee reviewed the rates and fees for 2024. And so while certain fees are capped at 2% um, because of the Build Back Better Assistance Strategy, um, which is still in place um, from COVID, the committee was supportive of increasing the drop-in rate for pool admissions. And that was something that council had asked the committee to consider um, earlier in the council term. And so at this point in time, a, a list of proposed fee increases will be provided at our upcoming budget meeting. And I think that's all that I had to report your worship, but certainly if there's any uh, questions, um, myself or Councillor Hudson would be pleased to take them. Thank you. Are there any questions? Councillor Fleet. Thank you, your worship, and thank you, uh, Councillor Cable. Uh, summer camps, 513 campers over eight weeks. Is that uh, up or is that normal or down from other years? Um, so typically I believe their maximum is 40 at their kids camp. Um, so if you go 40 times six weeks, that's 240. The rest is your, uh, specialty camps. I would have to find out whether that's an increase or decrease from, from staff and get back to you. Thank you. Well, I, just, I was just curious to see what those numbers are up or down. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, so we do have a mover and seconder, and we have a motion, which is to receive the information and approve the recommendations in those two se sets of minutes. All in favor? That is carried. Thank you. So item 11 is um, bylaws, and we have one bylaw. I need a mover and seconder before I ask the clerk for the intent of the bylaw. Councillor Fleet and Councillor Cable. Vicki, the intent, please. Bylaw 3279-23 is a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Town of Hanover at its regular meeting held on August 14th, 2023. Thank you. So it's been moved by Councillor Fleet, seconded by Councillor Cable, that bylaw number 3279-23 be introduced and that, they, that it be taken as read a first, second, and third time finally passed signed by the mayor and the clerk, sealed with the seal of the corporation and inserted in the bylaw book. All those in favor? That is carried, thank you. Item 12 is correspondence requiring action and uh, we have 12.1 and this is correspondence from the municipality of Brockton and they are inviting the municipality of West Gray and the town of Hanover to undertake a public process to consider authorizing the sale of the Saugeen Municipal Airport or to undertake um, 
uh, voluntary winding up of the airport. And then uh, further to that, if that is not uh, direction, they're looking in that uh, the cost sharing agreement be updated. So discussion on this correspondence. Who wants to start? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, part of the content of the letter is to say, uh, to applaud the, uh, the commission and the, uh, the staff that have worked out there, because I think they've worked really hard over the last few years to, uh, to, to kind of right the ship or whatever you might do. So I, I might, my thanks to them. I'm, I'm not sure I'm ready to support a, a motion to offer the airport for sale. But what I personally would like to see is, is some kind of a staff report from the actual economic impact that it does have on our on our town and our what it does for our residents. I sometimes feel that it's uh, not doesn't really do a lot for the population on, on, as a whole. It's nice to have. It's a, it's a great facility, but I'm not 100% sure what it really does for us from an economic economic standpoint. So I don't know if this is something April could could put together a report or someone uh, somewhere along the line, but uh, I'd like to better understand what it does or doesn't do for us before we take any action on this request from Brockton. Thank you for that. And uh, I just wanna say, I'm not asking for a mover or seconder until we decide what direction we are going to move forward with. Okay, Councillor Hawking. I don't know how to start this. I've been thinking about it. Um, if you had asked me this, uh, presented this to me uh, six years or five years ago before I became involved with the uh, airport, I would have said, yeah, and, you know, it makes some sense. You know, there, there and I thank uh, Deputy Mayor for his recognition that we've worked very hard hard over the last five years faced with legal issues, staffing issues, flatline budgets. So um, I was all prepared in March to call a meeting to say it, it's sort of time to fish or cut bait with, with our funding because, um, you know, there were no, no money set aside for capital. We were faced with... Uh, either get a fuel pedestal or close the airport down by the uh, federal agency out of Ottawa, which put us in debt, which made everybody, you know, sort of cough a bit that we were running a, a deficit. But since that time, um, you know, we have aviation school now, we have a viable airport, we have rentals going up as a result of uh, meetings. And I just want to leave you with this message when you talk about economic development and tourism. And I, I thank you as counselors for coming out and showing awareness because that means a lot to, to the staff out there. So on um, Kids to Fly Day, we took it upon us to invite MPP Lisa Thompson, Minister of Agricultural and Food, because the airport's in her riding. She came that morning and spent over an hour and a half, you know, doing the politician thing, getting a picture taken and stuff like that. But she toured two hangars, met with the pilots. And at the end of the meeting, she sat down with me and said, do you know something, David? You have a political jewel here sitting in, in the south of Grey Bruce. The potential for economic development and tourism is inevitable. She says, I'm gonna take it upon myself to contact other ministries. And she encouraged us to invite, and I've shared this with uh, April because we're now going into our second forum. And, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute, but to include the economic development manager for the county of Huron. So we then have a three county approach. Her enthusiasm, was one of the best medicine I've had in three years. You know, I, I have to admit to you, it has not been an easy ride. We've been faced with issue after issue. We come out the other side and we're still highly motivated. 
And I think when you toured that as counselors, you saw the, 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 the potential. Unfortunately, some of the other counselors haven't, uh, haven't um, accepted my personal invitation for orientation of the airport. So we do have a disjointed um, idea of what happens at that airport. So um, April has been working very closely with us. And in June, we had, for the first time ever, we had the economic development manager for the county of Gray, the county of Bruce, and the three from the, our supporting municipalities. We shared that with our pilots and there was great enthusiasm and some said, can we come to the second one, which is on October the 11th? So we're, we're just turning the corner. I have to tell you that my first four years, we were doing nothing but legal issues and, and things that really, really isn't what I, I was excited about joining the airport. It has great, great potential. So um, why did I want a meeting in March? I wanted to find out just exactly what municipalities are willing to uh, allocate to the airport because we had one municipality that just in rising inflation and costs said 0%. Well, that impacted Hanover, it impacted West Gray. I guess you know the municipality that said zero to us because we have a formula and that formula is outdated. It's 2005. So I welcome the report because I've been asking and asking for transparency reasons what is the revenue that municipalities get from the airport? Because hangers, owners pay taxes. We pay taxes. So that is a good thing. And it's a good thing that we're meeting to discuss the overall cost sharing because, you know, and the, and the agreement does say every five years. And that, of course, has been overlooked for the years. So I, I attended the, the Brockton meeting along with um, Deputy Chair, uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, Tom Hutchison, West Grave. And it's not stated in this report, but they did say publicly, at least one counselor did, that they would allow the Soggy Municipal Airport to also produce a corresponding report, which is welcome news to us because we can do exactly what Deputy Mayor, um, sorry. I'm all tied up here. Deputy Mayor mentioned um, uh, the economic value. Um, a lot of people are going to look at the negatives, you know, and we need to look at the this uh, SWOT analysis and and do a detailed Deputy Mayor Dicker, pardon me. So um, I I am I'm kind of I'm not I am looking forward to this report. However, I think it's incumbent upon Brockton to be the lead in this report. I think they have, uh, if they want to, uh, we'll certainly supply all the information to them. They can come up with the report. They can report back to West Gray and to the municipality of Hanover, their findings and why, because I keep asking, why do you feel this way? Why? And we never get the answer to why. So this is good news. It's good news for the residents of Brockton to find out why they have a certain position, why it's opposite to mainly our position at the Soggy Minnesota Airport. Do they have some justifications? I'm repeating, they most certainly do. We did run into some hiccups, but we have met them head on and we are trying desperately to pay off that deficit of close to $40,000. And I want to repeat this because everybody thinks it's just legal fees. It's not just legal fees. It's a shortcoming of uh, the three municipalities, I should say two of the municipalities for not extending a reserve for capital equipment. We go through an asset management here. We need to do the same thing. And I think Councillor Cable mentioned that a year and a half or two years ago, and it's on our agenda all the time. But we have squeezed out all of our, any capital that we had to make sure the airport stayed open because that bill was $38,000 for a fuel pedestal and we had to pay it. So there is the majority of our debt 
And I'm confident that on an operational uh, aspect, we can run a balance. Do we need work on the capital? Absolutely. Because the, if we have an issue, we have to take from the operations to pay for the for pay for the pay for the expense. So that's not a good thing. So in conclusion, I walk on the report. It's a good thing to it happen. People need to know. Everybody has to, you know, justify the importance. I understand ratepayers of of Hanover pay for it. There is a perception out there that it that it really is just for a certain clientele. But we want to prove to the community, and I, I'm, I'm going to go back to Lisa Thompson's. We have to look at the potential of that place, its economic benefit to the to the region, and all of the other things that it will bring to our municipality. Do we benefit? We probably benefit the most because of, of its location. Even though it's in, in uh, Brockton, People, you know, come to our 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 town for businesses, and, and so there's there is a spin off. Have we done a great job documenting that? We have not. However, I have thoroughly enjoyed, even though I get sometimes frustrated with my experience on it. I have learned a lot. I'm committed, and I will make sure that when my term of uh, chair of this commission is through, it'll either be on a very, very good financial setting, or we turn and say, folks, we can't do it. We need to, we need to look at another option. However, if we look at the other option, please never sell it so that it loses its airport function. It is critical that that maintain in our, our foreseeable future. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to go all over the place like I normally do, but I am passionate about it, but not to the point that I'm not focused on it. It needs to be done, but I think it needs to be done by one municipality doing an in-depth study, giving us the pros and cons so that the questions that Deputy Mayor Dickard asked, and asked me can be answered and can be done so that it's financially feasible. And if it's not, then we'll have to bite the bullet and do the right thing. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your support. And uh, as I said, carry on. Thank you, Councillor Hawking. You can tell you're very passionate. So are there any other comments or questions? I see Councillor Cable, then Councillor Fleet. I thank your worship. And thank you very much, uh, Councillor Hawking, for. Uh, for your comments as well. I, I agree that the Soggy Municipal Airport is a great asset to our region and it's certainly an asset for uh, local health care as well. Um, I see a lot of potential for the airport site. Um, you know, ideas that have been proposed in the past few years, like airport hangar homes and the development of an airport community really excites me. Um, but I think I'm just worried that some of the ideas won't really come to fruition in the current ownership model. Um, while our annual contribution to the airport is minimal in the grand scheme of things, um, I think potential long-term capital upgrades also worry me. Um, what happens when the airport runway needs to be upgraded or when the terminal building needs to be repaired? And will each of the, the uh, three owners be willing to come you know, and bear the cost for those um, large capital um, items? So I would like to see a staff report come back and outline the status of the current partnership agreement, which I believe is being updated. And I'd also like to see projected capital requirements for the airport over a five and 10 year time horizon so that we have uh, more information in order to make an informed decision. Councillor Fleet. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I, like with uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Dickard, I, I agree we need a report brought back to council. Um, I think we need to keep all our options open for this, for our airport. Uh, it's very important to our area. I think we really need to sit down West Gray and Brockton and have a one-on-one -on -one and really see where these uh, other communities stand. Um, you know, we're coming into budget season, uh, you know, and the airport's part of our budget. So I think it'd be very beneficial to uh, try to have this sorted out before we uh, go to uh, budget. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? So what I'm hearing is we will ask staff to bring a report back with next steps. 
because there are more options than what was listed in this uh, cor correspondence from Brockton. And I'm not sure I can ask our CAO within with that report, would you include the economic benefits or would that be a secondary report? I'm going to suggest that that would probably be a secondary report. I think next steps are immediate, and what can we, um, what are the next steps to um, get to that final staff report, identifying and including the things that council has uh, had me feverishly writing in the last five ten minutes. Is council agreeable with that? We'll start with the first report and. I'm not sure how long that will take, um, but when it's completed, it will be brought to council. Councillor Hawking. Yes, there, there, there's just one other option that's not in this letter. You should be aware of it, that when a municipality withdraws support from the uh, Soggy Municipal Airport, um, they then lose any value on that airport and they must contribute to the to the budget for two consecutive years. But if that should happen, then we would have it basically owned by two municipalities. So they lose ownership, which is a significant cost when you look at the value of that, that piece of land. I can tell you what it's assessed at, but everyone knows that the assessment doesn't mean that's what it's worth. That just means what we pay taxes on. And it's it's uh, sizable. So um, just uh, keep that in mind too when you're doing your study that there is a third option. Thank you. And I would like to suggest there is a fourth option that another municipality may want to join. And I'm thinking of South Bruce with the DGR happening. There's a whole 10 years when you start thinking further out they may want to participate. So, Councillor Fleet. Thank you, Your Worship. And uh, listen to Councillor Hawk, and you know, if Brockton decided to back out and it was it was West Gray Hanover, the property sitting in Brockton and they value from the tax dollars of that airport or that property. And so I, I think it's very important that the three uh, communities work together to come up with a solution to this uh, problem. May I counter that by saying, if two municipalities owned it and had and then sold it, it would get, you would get fifty percent of the net value of the property, not thirty three percent. So something to think about if you're looking at the if you're looking at the money aspect of it. But there's more than just money. Thank you. Okay, good discussion, and I think our CEO has um, lots of notes there to um, do the report. Is there anything else you want? included with that sherry just maybe i'll just clarify with vicky do we need a motion and uh accordingly to reflect that direction i would suggest that we do adopt a motion giving staff direction that also allows the other counselors to uh, see what we're discussing so so i do need a mover and seconder for next steps and um We'll let the CAO go from there. So I have Councillor Hawking and Deputy Mayor Dickert. All in favor? That is carried. We're good. Thank you. Good discussion. All right. Uh, item 13 is reports and correspondence for information. The first one, 13.1, is a report PB 22-23, the subject is the site plan agreement for Candu Homes. It's from Andrew Wilkin, our Director of Building and Planning and CBO. Andrew. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, on March 10th, 2022, an application for consent was submitted to our office. Uh, the purpose was to sever lands uh, and create a new lot with frontage onto 17th Street Crescent and to allow construction of two new single detached dwellings on the property known at that time as 696 17th Street Crescent. Uh, on April 26, 2022, the Committee of Adjustment granted the consent. Uh, there was a condition on that, um, that a site plan control agreement uh, come into effect with the town, although uh, single family dwellings and semis for that matter, um, 
are not within the scope of site plan control. Uh, if the applicant is agreeable to that, uh, it can be a condition. So that is what occurred here. Uh, due to the concerns related to the proposed 50 uh, foot lot frontage and the impact within the immediate neighborhood, uh, they are larger lots uh, back in this location. Uh, we felt it was essential for the proposed homes to be harmonized with the existing homes, which was a topic of discussion at the public meeting process for the Committee of Adjustment. Consequently, a site plan control agreement has been implemented to address the concerns of the neighboring residents. There are no financial implications uh, to this report. The link to the strategic plan is healthy and welcoming community, balanced growth, and open and responsible government. And the recommendation is that report PB 22-23 site plan agreement uh, be received by council for information. I'll answer any questions. Thank you, Andrew. Are there any questions? Councillor Sacco. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I'm curious about a couple of things. First of all, I notice there's only one address still on the site plan. Does that second address get out later or will it be an A and a B situation? Uh, through your worship. Yeah, te technically the site plan control agreement was a condition of the consent. So technically it was, it's the address of the original property before it was severed to two, which is why it's just the one. Both properties are shown, however, in the agreement. So will there be a new number issued later? Uh, a street address? Yes. Yes. Okay. It's been issued. I want to say it's 698. Okay. And do you happen to know when they're going to start actually building on that property? Uh, through your worship, yes. They did a bit of a um, service tie-in earlier this summer. Uh, that developer is building in the new subdivision and some other infill properties in town. I'm assuming they're lining that construction up with some of the other ones they're doing in town. Okay, so that was for information. The next report is 13.2. This is page 47 in our package. It is report PW17-23. It is the wastewater treatment plant operations reports from Mr. Cooper, our director of public works. Ron. Thank you, Worship. Uh, this wastewater report, uh, the details of it have been provided by our chief operator. Ted Knopf, and he is with us uh, on the line here today. And uh, I can get him to take you through through the report. Okay, um, uh, so I've prepared the uh, wastewater treatment operations report for the period of April 1st to June 30th, 2023. Uh, just some of the highlights and major activities at the waste plant during that time. Uh, Bi-weekly toxicity sampling uh, happened on April 12th, April 26th, and May 10th. Uh, all three of those uh, tests came back positive with uh, zero mortality, which means we, uh, we have uh, been uh, allowed to go to reduce quarterly testing, uh, which our first one was on July 17th, and we actually we passed that one too. Um, in April, late April and early May, we uh, received uh, seed sludge from the Walkerton wastewater treatment plant to uh, help reactivate or rebuild our nitrifying bacteria. Uh, our nitrifying bacteria in our aeration cells was uh, killed off in, I say, middle of February uh, to about middle of March uh, due to strong um, waste coming in uh, to the waste plant uh, and basically we can't uh, we couldn't wait for the the nitrifiers to rebuild themselves it would take too long it would take another four to six weeks so uh, we uh, we got seed sludge from the walking and sewage plant to rebuild them quickly and to uh, get to recover our plant back up to uh, uh, to get it back into compliance uh, we also we hauled uh, some bio uh, solids uh, from May 15th to, or sorry, yeah, May 15th to the 18th. Uh, Soggy Niagara Services uh, was the company that hauled them out to a non uh to a, uh, a site that uh, had an ASM plan. Uh, and we have had a lot of ongoing system maintenance to the waste plant 
a lot of electrical issues uh, lately. Um, so uh, a lot of our electrical uh, units or equipment is 40, 40 plus years old. Uh, and we're starting to starting to have some issues with it. Uh, so we've been uh, getting haze in uh, every every so often to uh, to help uh, repair and upgrade some of our, our equipment. Uh, I would gladly take any any questions if anyone would have any. Thanks, Ted. Are there any uh, questions or comments for Ted? Councillor Cable. No, thank you, Worship. Um, Ted, I'm just looking at the month of April, and so your daily average um, cubic meters is over the, the optimal design capacity. So can you just explain kind of what that does to the system or how that you know impacts your day or um, kind of the impact of, of that on the system? Uh, so when you have higher flows, uh, it affects our waste plant. Um, basically, you don't get the same uh, amount of retention time in your tanks to let settling happen in uh, biological process happen properly. Um, so instead of being in a tank for eight hours, you know, it's reduced to, you know, seven or six, uh, and you just don't get quite the same, uh, same treatment or removal of, uh, um, of organics or, or uh, solids and BOD and stuff like that. Uh, so yes, uh, higher flows does make it a touch, touch harder to uh, treat the waste. Uh, the only benefit, or it's not really a benefit, but uh, when we do have higher flows in March and April, usually the waste is a little, uh, isn't quite as strong. It's a little bit more diluted. Uh, but that being said, it is still a bit harder to, uh, to treat. Excellent. Thank you. And do we know why it was so much higher in the month of April? Uh, so generally, uh, our flows are higher in... Uh, end of February, March, April, and May from, uh, from snow melt. Uh, we have uh, infiltration issues with, uh, with the old, older sewers in town. Uh, so uh, yes, our, our flow is always, uh, always seem to go up with, uh, with the snow melt and heavy rains. Excellent, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll go on to the next report. This is um, item 13.3, it is report PW18-23, and it is the water treatment plant operations report, again from Mr. Cooper, our Director of Public Works. Thank you, Worship. Uh, quarterly report April 1st to the end of June for water treatment. Uh, it's pre been prepared by uh, Ted Knapp, our Chief Operator, so I will have him uh, take you through the report. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ron. Uh, so uh, this is a water treatment operations report from uh, April 1st to June 30th, 2023. Uh, some of the major highlight, highlights and ac major activities during this uh, period include, uh, so we had an adverse water quality incident uh, on AWQI on April 20th. Uh, it was reported to Spills Action Center and the Ministry of Health uh, right away. Uh, this was due to uh, increased turbidity on a filter that uh, that was above uh, above standard for over 15 minutes, over, over one NTU for 15 minutes. Uh, There's no water that was discharged to dist uh, distribution system due to this. Uh, we dumped the clear well before that could happen uh, and, and flushed and backwashed uh, the clear well to get rid of uh, any of the... Uh, high turbid turbid water on april 21st we had another awqi uh and it was also reported to the spills action center and to uh, the ministry of health and uh this was be basically due to the other awqi uh the uh, operator uh brought the the clear wall down a little too low which airlocked our chlorine pumps uh which caused uh, low chlorine uh and due to this we had to uh, uh backwash uh the distribution system back to the plant until chlorine was uh residual was back up to uh standards and then we also took some uh um bacterial samples at the uh first service and at the point of entry of the into the uh distribution system uh which all came back good uh, and then uh, 
we've had ongoing issues with our SCADA system basically since I started here. Um, we are right now uh, in plans or uh, in, in the, we're currently researching upgrades to our SCADA system uh, with a SCADA strategy plan, which should uh, be completed by mid to the mid to end of uh, November uh, with, with hopes to uh, possibly implement uh, a new SCADA system next year. Um, I would gladly take any questions if anyone has any. Thanks, Ted. Any questions or comments for Ted? Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to the next report. Thank you very much, Ted. Thank you. Okay, item 13.4, this is report ED0423. The subject is the inaugural mayor's breakfast for business and it's from April Marshall, our economic development manager. April. Thank you, Your Worship. So on behalf of yourself, I'm pleased to announce the inaugural mayor's breakfast for business. Um, this is um, in response to a discussion held at our May 17th Economic Tourism and Cultural Development Advisory Committee meeting, where we recognize the need to further engage our business community and help provide more, inf more information as well as an outlet for them to uh, share comments, questions, or concerns. Um, this was soon identified as an opportunity to further uh, discuss with Mayor Patterson and her mandate to further engage and build communications uh, with businesses and stakeholders in the town of Hanover. So with this, we're pleased to announce that the inaugural Breakfast for Business is set to occur on Thursday, October 5th, and will take place at the Hanover Legion Branch 130. A hot breakfast will be prepared by the Legion Ladies Auxiliary. And the following Town of Hanover presentations will be delivered by staff. Uh, we're going to talk about um, our new strategic plan, our community profile, being age-friendly for business, the customer service portal, building and bylaw updates, and of course, again, ask, providing that opportunity for people to ask questions or for, connect further with us. Uh, we're going to, this event is being organized in partnership with the Hanover Chamber of Commerce, DIA, and our HIP Entrepreneur Campaign. Uh, tickets are $15 each, and this is to help offset the cost for rent and breakfast. Um, and additional marketing support will be um, lent through our economic development approved budget. So um, we do our um, asking people to go to Eventbrite to register and pay for their tickets, but we recognize that not all residents have the ability to do that. So we are set up here at the municipal office to be able to take, um, to, to take registration as well. Um, so this is uh, links to our strategic plan as far as goal two, healthy and welcoming community and goal three, strong and vibrant community. And the recommendation is that report ED0423, inaugural mayor's breakfast for business, be received for information. And I would be happy to answer any questions anyone may have. Thanks, April. And just to be clear, you don't have to have a business to attend this. You can, any resident is welcome to attend this and find out what's happening in our community. So it's open to everyone. So any questions or comments? I'll have to get up early. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. It sounds exciting, you know, our first one. So we'll we'll see. So very good. Item 13.5 is report ED0523. It's welcoming week and culture days. And from April Marshall, our economic development manager. And this is for information. April. Thank you again, your worship. Uh, so uh, highlighting culture is um, important to us, as we know, through our HIP culture campaign. So we wanted to bring um, the following activities or initiatives to council and residents' attention in that regard. So we just celebrated Welcoming Week. It occurred September 9th and ran through the 17th. So this is a global initiative that encourages individuals and communities to spread the message of inclusion and coll collective prosperity. So we worked in collaboration with the Gray Bruce Local Immigration Partnership or GB LIP as we like to call them. Um, and they essentially took all local community efforts 
and then built a regional communication plan um, to help spread the message and, and invitations. So Hanover events and our initiatives included at the Hanover Public Library, we had a welcoming week display. And then we also offered two free skates last week um, on Wednesday and Sunday. Um, in addition to that, we encourage new residents to come in and pick up their welcome packages. Um, so this is all in an effort to promote our local culture and be a welcoming community. Um, in addition to that, coming up is Culture Days. So Culture Days is a national celebration of arts and culture at the end of each September, where millions of people attend thousands of free participa participatory uh, arts and culture events across the country, both in person and online. So Hanover Culture Days um, is set to occur September 22nd to October 5th in um, coordination with the provincial campaign and some of the highlighted hip culture events that we have during this time include promoting the fall harvest market that is returning to heritage square and that'll be this saturday it's an opportunity for people to discover treasures savor flavors and create memories and an enchanting gathering of community creations we also are working with many of our uh, cultural community groups uh, to provide a cultural showcase that will be happening here in the Civic Center in the community hall, and that will be on September 23rd as well. So the Heritage Committee will have a display which will in include an antique nectal furniture bedroom set. The Graybrew Singers will have a display. The Hanover Community Players will have a prop make and take workshop, and Sogging Artists Guild will have an exhibit in collaboration with the Hanover Public Library, and that will feature multi-talented works by local artists. Uh, Sogging Artists Guild also invites people to participate in the fall studio tour, which will be happening the following weekend, where you can actually get into the studios of local artists across the Gray and Bruce region. We also have the Eat Well Farmer's Market that will continue to run uh, September 30th and October 7th, with October 7th being the last day for the season. And people are also encouraged to take those self-guided public art tours. We have our downtown public um, public uh, street banner project and the Heritage Square and um, Clock Tower murals. Um, we also have our butterfly mural in the DIA parquet. So there's lots to see and do. Um, more information can be found at hanover.ca forward slash culture dash days. And again, this is in line with strategic direction, goal two, healthy and welcoming community and goal three, strong and vibrant community. So the recommendation is that report ED0523, welcoming week and culture days be received for information. Thank you. Very good, lots happening. Mm -hmm. Any comments or questions? Councillor Sackle. Thank you, Your Worship. I just like to congratulate you, April. You have done so much work for Culture Days and everything that you do, of course, for us, for the town of Hanover. Um, I'm particularly happy to announce that Mother Nature looks like she's going to shine on Saturday. So I'm very excited about all the events. And I just want to thank you again. Okay, item 13.6 is uh, Launchpad regular board meeting minutes, and there are three sets of minutes, and the first set will be uh, highlighted by Councillor Cable. Oh, thank you, Worship. And uh, the Launchpad board um, apologizes for the uh, minutes coming in all at one time, and we're going to try to find a new process to ensure that they come in a more timely fashion. Uh, the Launchpad Board of Directors met on June the 6th. Uh, we received a report from Barry Heaney um, with 2022 audited financial statements for Launchpad, which included the loan provided to eliminate Launchpad's previous deficit. So that was included in the statements that he presented. Uh, Christine Sampson, who uh, was the interim operations manager, provided the board with an update on the upcoming Tools in the Trades Boot Camp, uh, which took place on July the 13th in partnership with uh, Supporting Ontario Youth, also known as SOI. Uh, which helped make connections between apprentices and employers. And uh, Councillor uh, Sacco will provide more details about that in her July update. Uh, the board held its annual general meeting on June the 23rd, and it was great to have the mayor in attendance for that. And um, at that time, uh, we were preparing for Ellie Green's work. Um, Ellie Green was recommended to us by uh, Gray County in order to help support the board in completing a SWOT analysis, which was looking at strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And um, LA conducted a session with the board, um, which also took place on June the 23rd, just before the annual general meeting. I will pass over to Councillor Sackle to highlight July and August. 
Thank you. I'm looking at uh, the July minutes first. Uh, the election of officers took place. Adam Olivero was elected as the board chair. Pierre Valley was elected as vice and Angela Wayne Scott elected as the secretary. Now, as you just heard on July 13th, uh, 21 registered job seekers attended a tools in the trade boot camp at Launchpad, where they had a full day of introduction to motive power and the transportation trade. And from this boot camp, Launchpad made some really good connections. Uh, first with VPI Employment and Adult Learning Center in Walkerton, and then with Life Directions in Flesherton. And they are now renting the space at Launchpad every Tuesday to complete an outreach program to help more people in the community who have barriers to get employment help. So we think that's pretty awesome. In terms of financials, the board will begin formalized budget expectations to be reviewed monthly for the key areas of focus, which would be adult programming, youth programming, field trips, and rentals. We had a very successful Working at Heights event, and we hope to continue to offer this event on a regular basis. We also agreed to host the not-for-profit Chamber of Commerce golf tournament putting hole on September 6th. You'll remember that, Deputy Mayor. I think, I'm not sure if you got soaked that day in the rain or not. <laughs> um, then the fundraising committee has plans for a matching gift giving Tuesday event, which will occur in November. I'll go on to the August minutes. And if you have any questions, I'll, I'll ask you to give them to me at that point. Um, a delegation and presentation by Dave Eccles from CMR occurred in August. Dave reviewed Launchpad's insurance concerning liability and volunteers and uh, incident log records, et cetera. Uh, Launchpad is under the town's website or umbrella rather, including $20 million for liability, $15,000 deductible for uh, claims. And our operations manager is meeting with Dave Eccles to go over other issues that may be uh, important to Launchpad. Uh, for a finance update, class sizes for after-school programming will increase to 10 participants, um, and that will help our revenue. Overall, at this time, the budget was showing a $45,063 surplus. That includes the town donation of $100,000. And in the operations manager report, there's a potential from the Iron Workers Union for a long-term rental to use Launchpad for a test and training facility two times a week. Um, are there any questions or comments at this time? Thank you, Councillor Sackle. Are there any comments, questions? I don't see any. All right, so we'll move on, thank you. Item 13.7, this is a notice from, um, the County of Gray that there is a Gray County Housing Forum that will take place on Friday, October 20th. It will be held at the Meaford and St. Vincent Community Center, and um, they will be exploring the state of housing in the area and discuss current challenges, and there is no cost if anyone wishes to attend. Item 13.8 is... Um, a motion from the Township of Southgate advising us that the Township will no longer pursue forming a working group to determine possible de development of a South Gray Housing Corporation. You'll remember we did um, pass um, a motion to appoint two people from this council to be part of that, but um, I, I don't know the reason why, but I would just assume that maybe uh, Gray County is taking the lead rather than having a, a separate housing uh, corporation. So a committee you're no longer on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes that's a good thing. Okay, um, councillor and staff updates. And we're gonna start with councillor Hawking this afternoon. Basically, it was spending a lot of time at, at the airport. Um, unfortunately, by mutual agreement, we lost uh, our two um, airport managers that we recently uh, hired. Uh, they just had uh, a, a lot going on. And uh, it was, a, as I said, a, a mutual agreement. We're currently uh, exploring the option of a, another highly qualified individual. So uh, that's all I have to report. Thank you, Councillor Hudson. 
Thank you, Your Worship. Um, other than just usual committees and meetings, uh, not a whole lot to report. The last music in the park was very good, but I would really like to encourage a lot more people to participate next year if we decide to do that again. It's a great venue. It's usually great weather, great bands, and it's it's all free of charge. So come on out and do that. And I also want to um, thank the people involved in doing the p &H tour that we did last Wednesday. They make that facility look like it runs seamlessly. And when you get in behind and see all the work that's required to make that visual the way that it is, it's quite incredible. So kudos to them and everybody that um, participates and makes it look like such a great facility that we have in our community. So thank you. Yes, and I want to say ditto because now I know when when we talk about the boiler replacement, it's just not a boiler replacement. There's going to be a lot more happening and you you wonder how it's going to be placed in there. So it was good to see that. I'm I'm glad I attended. So I, I neglected to say that we do have our AMO reports attached to our counselor um, updates. If there is something in those reports that you feel you want to highlight that the residents should uh, really know about at this time, please do so. Other, otherwise, the residents can access them on our website. So I'll go back to you, Councillor Hudson. Was there anything you wanted to highlight? Well, I really would like to highlight that portable washroom that I saw at the AMO event. I know it's really crazy to get excited about something like that, but uh, to have a to have a facility that is so not hands on, although things are operated, um, you know, by computers with the staff, et cetera, it was it was pretty phenomenal to see that um, something like that has been created by someone, and it's like way steps higher than a porta potty. So. That, that was my exciting thing from AMO. And I'm really surprised about that because everyone I've seen has been $300,000. So there's something very different between them, but it's, it's not plumbed in, it's portable. So it's, uh, it's pumped, yes. Anyway, it's exciting. Good, good. All right, uh, Councillor Cable. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I won't highlight the entire um, report from the AMO conference, but it, it really was a great uh, learning and professional development experience. I always appreciate um, attending. Um, there was certainly a significant focus on housing and housing affordability, um, as well as um, environmental climate action and the need for municipalities to play a key role in moving climate action forward. So um, I'm really excited to see our um, environmental advisory committee or climate action committee, whatever we, um, you know, uh, see that being uh, moving forward, I believe in 2024. Um, being able to go out to the West Five um, Sustainable Community by Sifton um, was definitely a highlight. Um, and so they have over 2,000 residential units on 70 acres. The community is entirely net zero, so it creates as much electricity as it uses in one year. And really, they stress that it takes a developer with a vision and a future, uh, really caring about, about the future and the environment and um, looking to build something a little bit different and unique, um, which can help to attract people as well. Um, so it really takes that, that developer to be on board in order to make that happen. Um, apart from the AMO conference, I would just highlight that the Hanover Bentick and Brand Agricultural Society continues to make progress with the former uh, casino renovation. We actually have a meeting with um, a firm this evening. Um, the RFP for Design and Construction Administration closed, and the Society um, will be interviewing several firms in hopes of making a recommendation to the board at their October meeting. Thank you. Councillor Hawking, did you have a comment for... Okay. Uh, okay. Councillor Sacco? Thank you, Your Worship. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the Town of Hanover for allowing me to attend the AMO conference. Uh, it was amazing to be at a conference with 2,500 other people, and that trade show illustrated that. There was very little room to walk around, for sure, and I, too, was excited about that, that portable washroom. Uh, there are many people that don't have a bathroom in their homes that look as beautiful as that thing did. Um, I was also impressed when my neighbor tells me that I was on television, and that was the day that Doug Ford was uh, there presenting. So I guess the camera caught me, and he was able to tell me what I was wearing and everything, so he wasn't pulling my leg. Um, I was 
I was wearing my red jacket. <laughs> um, it was really um, nice to meet, or uh, at least indirectly, uh, the Honorable Elizabeth Dowdswell and uh, Catherine McKenna. I was quite impressed with the climate change talk. Um, I was impressed with the um, net zero community that Councillor Cable talked about. I was on that bus tour and it was pretty fascinating how they've created this mini little world. Um, I also um, was happy to go to the homelessness session on Wednesday morning, but disappointed to see that the numbers were so few that morning when it's such an important topic in our world today. Um, I also enjoyed um, just one about automotion, automo sorry, um, I'll get it here. The whole idea of driving and young people not realizing that driving under the influence of cannabis is going to be a, a hefty fine, just like it is if you were drinking and driving. And the little things like that, I, I began to wonder about Launchpad. I, I put it in my report about, I wonder if we could create a program about driving and just do something for you know 10 students like they're suggesting for fall programming just something that crossed my mind um, beyond amo i also uh, enjoyed the tour last week that was phenomenal to see behind the scenes i'd been in the pool many times and that was about the extent of it i'd fallen on the ice rink once when the ice was out and we were rollerblading or roller skating but no it was really fascinating to see and i appreciate having that opportunity so again thank you I'd also like to thank April for the cultural roundtable invite that I was given to meet with Minto and Wellington North and those people that were on cultural roundtable and to hear what they are doing and collaborating with them, I thought was a wonderful opportunity. And it was also nice to go to the warden's forum, which I had never been. And I don't know the last time I was in Holstein either. So thank you. Very good. Deputy Mayor Dickert. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to Gray County for allowing me to attend the AMO conference. Uh, and I think everybody's captured pretty well uh, the highlights there, but it is certainly time well spent uh, being able to network with fellow uh, representatives from the municipalities and, and the great things you do see in the trade show there. Uh, in addition to that, the Chamber Golf, I did manage to stay dry. I did not, uh, I, I got off the golf course in time and didn't get wet, but uh, congratulations to the Chamber on uh, on a successful event, well attended. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't have as good a weather as they usually have, but uh, it was still a great event and uh, and the Warden's Forum as well. And it was uh, it was great to share that strategic planning work that uh, the Gray County is doing and how it can tie in with ours. So uh, that is my report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fleet. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, I want to thank the town also for allowing me to go to AMO. Um, my highlight it was uh, meeting with the uh, Minister of Infrastructure and having Rick Byers uh, attend the meeting with us. I think it went very well, and it was, I hope it's a very positive outcome, in, uh, outcome uh, for our community. I, that was one of my highlights. Um, something that stuck by, I was at a delegation, I think it was for Clean Energy, uh, sponsored by Hydro One, and one of the sayings is old ways won't open new doors. And that's stuck in my head. And it's, you know, you really think, wow, that's well said. Um, so I really enjoyed AMO. Uh, I also attended the provincial single triple tournament in Hanover for Lawn Bowling Club. Congratulations to the Hanover Lawn Bowling Club. I'd also like to uh, say uh, congratulations to Ryan Bester, formerly of Hanover, lives in Australia. He represents the Hanover Lawn Bowling Club. He just won the World Men's Single Tournament in Australia. So congratulations, Ryan Bester. Uh, and he represents Hanover, Ontario. So that's congratulations. Uh, attend the Hanover Barons home opener. Good luck to the Barons. Uh, attend the final season of Raceway. Uh, congratulations to everyone. Live betting was up 20%. So live betting is betting with the people that are at the races. So that's great news for the raceway. And I've attended all my committee meetings. And on another note, uh, Linda Fiddler is looking for volunteers for the Harvest Fall Market this Saturday. To, and we're to meet in the park at 8.30 for anybody that would like to volunteer to help set up. That's all I have to report. Thank you. Very good. And I also want to thank Gray County for the opportunity to attend AMO. And, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed all the sessions. You always learn something, you know. And I just want to say the one thing that stuck with me when you say there's a, you know, a one sentence that stays with you. I remember the one the doctor saying, 
on the last day about homelessness, if you had to spend six months in a shelter, what do you think your mental health would be like? And I think that says it all. So, so and I've attended lots of uh, openings and things that ha are happening around town, but the one that was the most interesting that the past month was the 75th anniversary of a group of kindergarten children. I don't know if everyone realizes the Hanover Legion used to be the school, the public school. So there was about 23 students who uh, came together for a reunion in the lounge side of the Legion, which is exactly where the kindergarten class was held. So they all, were all there, all excited, and they recognized each other. Like, I don't know how they did that. So anyway, they had fun and like, it was, it was just nice to see 75 years later that they got together. So, all right, so Councillor Hawking. Yes, thank you, Worship. I, I just want to uh, uh, make a point to, to, the, to the citizens of Hanover and, uh, and anyone who uh, can access this uh, agenda to take a, a moment and read the council's reports of the recent AMO um, conference. I, I found it very, very rewarding and almost to the point that I saved the uh, municipality some money because I could get a feel of what was taking place just through your note taking. So uh, well done. And uh, I want you to, I don't, I shouldn't say that I like that, but um, I, I took a great, um, interest in Councillor Sackle's report when she made the comment, it's a quotation, and I think we have to keep this in mind because of uh, budget is coming down, down the pipe. And it, the, the quote was, parks and recreation are not nice services, they are critical infrastructure. So um, as a longtime proponent of recreation and culture in our community, and the fact that our strategic plan, our residents indicated that as a number one and number two priority, I, I would ask that we keep that in focus because sometimes these soft services can be uh, looked upon as, as an easy, easy way to solve uh, uh, the budgetary issue. So again, Thank you, colleagues, for such well-written reports, and um, it, it really was um, interesting to read them. Thanks again. Thank you, and I can say that session with Parks and Rec uh, had the smallest room and the most people there. You know, it was very tight. People were standing on the back walls two, three deep, and like if there was one seat, if somebody got up and left, it was gone. Somebody took it, so... And I, I know it's difficult for AMO to determine how many people, like they choose their rooms, but that one, that seemed to be the priority for everyone. So it was good. Okay, on the agenda, item 15, planning and other meetings. Of course, all our meetings are listed on this agenda and on our website. Item 16 is, uh, I should just take one step back. There's one change on those on that meeting date, and uh, age friendly committee is meeting on October 23rd rather than on the 16th. Just if you wanted to make a note, if you were attending it, dates to remember and announcements. The next committee of the whole meeting is October 2nd at 4 p.m. The next regular council meeting is October 16th at 4 p.m. Our municipal office will be closed on Thanksgiving Monday, which is October 9th. The Mayor's Breakfast is October 5th, doors open at 7.30, and Culture Days are from September 22nd to October 15th. We do not, uh, I shouldn't say that. Does anyone have a notice of motion? Okay, and before we move on to the next item, Sherry has a... Uh, just that staff promptly replied to my summer camp question. So don't we have a great team when I can send them a message and 
they replied. So to answer Councillor Fleet's question that was asked during the Parks, Recreation and Culture Advisory Committee minutes about summer camp, in 2022, there were 458 campers and in 2023, there was 512. So that's an up, uh, increase of 54. And most of that, well, there was an increase in both areas. Sorry, I wrote down a number wrong here. Um, the camp, kids camp, which is your typical summer camp program, had 295 children registered, and that's over an eight week period. And the specialty camps had 217 campers, and that's with 12 specialty camps that were offered. So there's some details to your question. It's a lot of details. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. And you know what? I forgot to ask staff if you have any updates you wanted to share that aren't in the minutes. Did you sure, go ahead? So I'm going to say two things. One was I really wish that the weather person cooperated more with the Terry Fox run yesterday because mm -hmm. that is such an important event. Um, I remember my grade six speech was on Terry Fox and I got to the Legion, the not the local King Carden finals, but the next. And that has just certainly resonated with me in my life, the Terry Fox story, and it should resonate with all Canadians. So it's really unfortunate weather person because they put on a really great event at the racetrack yesterday. So kudos to that uh, group. And I know Gateway staff took a, a leadership role there. And then secondly, um, our residents who are listening, uh, last Monday, the municipal office, if you attended, it was closed. We had our very first uh, bursting uh, staff professional development session. And we brought all of our permanent part-time staff and our full-time staff together for a full day of uh, professional development. And it was an investment in them. And our contract and part-time students were also welcome to attend. We just knew that they may not be able to based on the scheduling of that. And it was a really uh, jam-packed agenda. Uh, looking forward to hearing the feedback from staff. And um, if you did attend that day, you were greeted by Mayor Sue and Councillor Sackle, um, just advising you that you can maybe get your help at the municipal office that day. But I understand that Mayor Sue was able to provide some flyers and some information. So a different way of interacting with our, our customers. So uh, again, we look forward to the, the information for our feedback from our staff. It, it was really a, a valuable day. Very good. All right. Um, so notices of motion. Does anyone have a notice of motion they want to bring forward? Seeing none, we do not have a closed meeting. So we need one more motion and that is to adjourn at 528. I have Councillor Hawking and Councillor Hudson. All in favor? That is carried. Thank you very much. Good meeting.